强大的国家都会走向灭亡呢？不列颠帝国、美国，美国政府企图以庞大的开支和税收来摆脱严重的经济衰退。当然，我们是他们的大债主。现在他们都得给我们干活。Welcome back to Power Corrupts Again, the program that spotlights corporate, government, and judicial corruption running out of control of we the people. Many of whom have much to catch up on in realizing that one reason our middle class is disappearing is because our government has been favoring the corporate elite and themselves at the expense of the rest of us, and as we can see today, at a great cost also to our security. I'm David Scheid, and today I have as my guest Dr. C. W. Bill Kaufman, and he is a retired professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. Where he was specializing in gas dynamics and propulsion, since junior high school, when he discovered that he could propel over the roof of his house, cone-top beer cans containing several stones of carbide and some drops of water, he has been interested in explosions. The research of his undergraduate advisor, which employed shock tubes, was of great interest to him, and it led him to an early. Industry position with the task of determining the cause of malfunctions in ICBM test flights—that's intercontinental ballistic missiles, folks. You know the kind designed for nuclear weapons. Dr. Kaufman's Ph.D. research at Michigan was funded by NASA, and it concerned combustion instabilities or two-phase detonations, which were occurring in the Rocketdyne F-1 engine to be employed on the Saturn V rocket. These results were applied to develop fuel air explosions, or FAE, for military purposes. This research was related very closely to the dust explosions that once frequently occurred in coal mines and grain elevators, where a rigorous program of investigations and legislation basically eliminated that industrial hazard. At the time, the Soviets were well known for their explosion experience. And international contacts were initiated nearly 40 years ago, leading to numerous technical discussions, interactions, visits, and even Dr. Kaufman setting up residence in the Russian Federation, where the technical opportunities grew to include the various aspects of flight and flight vehicles. This combination of experience in explosions and aviation resulted in Dr. Bill Kaufman be, being the first runner-up. For the 1984 vacancy on the National Transportation Safety Board, a frequent press source for aviation disasters, and Dr. Kaufman was also selected for a position with the Federal Aviation Administration, working to prevent fuel vapor explosions aboard aircrafts. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman. You have brought with you a guest today. Would you please introduce us?、Uh, this is Doug Smith.、Uh, he's a retired professor of pathology. At the University of Michigan, and he was in charge of transplants to make sure the right organ gets into the right person. And、uh, I met him because of his concerns for ethics and morals at the University of Michigan and abuses by the administration. And he's both a Ph.D. and an M.D. and comes from Iowa. And Doug, why don't you say a few words about yourself?、Uh, hi, thank you for having me, Dave. My pleasure. I、um, uh, I, I grew up in Iowa. And my parents both、uh, taught in the medical school at the University of Iowa, and I did my medical degree at at Iowa, and then I did my Ph.D. degree in experimental pathology at the University of Minnesota, and th th I did my internship in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and、um, then I, I went on to support some of the largest transplant programs in the United States at the University of Nebraska, the University of Oklahoma,、uh, Baylor University Medical Center, and then the University of Michigan. Got it. Transplants and medical.、Right. You've got a PhD and an MD. Yes, got it. Well, Dr. Kaufman,、um, uh, can you give us a little background on、uh, why we're here today? Because、uh, I know that、uh, both of you have、uh, taken a pretty strong stand 
on uh, what's been going on with our corporate uh, corporations, our um, our universities, um, uh, and China. Well, Dave, uh, we have to summarize what's happened over the past decade, perhaps, but. Basically, our nation is on the verge of economic and military failure. <clears throat> and, I mean, you can see it everywhere, um, the unemployment rate, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what's happening that, that's really exacerbating this situation is the theft of almost everything of value from our nation by the Chinese, the mainland Chinese, the People's Republic of China. Uh, they're stealing our military technology, they're stealing our industrial technology, they're stealing our know-how. Almost anything that's, that's not fastened down, they've taken back. And this has been going on for a period of time <clears throat> by large numbers of Chinese students and also people who are employed in America, uh, what we call sleeper agents. They've been here for a long time and they've carefully been accumulating things that their nation needs in order to become a superpower. And I think now people are realizing, whoops, there's something going on. And for me, I found out that, gee, at the University of Michigan, we're almost hemorrhaging what is valuable to our nation, and it has to stop. And um, the University of Michigan has had a long history of historical ties with China because James Angel, president of the University of Michigan in 1880, was the first ambassador to China. And he went to China, and he brought back some Chinese women, more as curiosities, because they had bound feet, they wore funny clothing, etc. But since that time, the University of Michigan has had Chinese students. Uh, 1880. 1880. So wow. there's an Angel Hall named after him, and mm -hmm. there's Angel Scholars, etc. But then the the next big event was in 1979. Jimmy Carter and his science expert, Frank Press. Uh, decided that China was on the verge of collapse because of the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, and you would have a billion people trying to immigrate somewhere in the world, so we had better do something to help the Chinese at least survive and feed themselves and provide basic necessities. So in 1980 approximately, we got our first serious influx of Chinese people at the University of Michigan, um, mostly professors. Uh, who came to learn humanitarian type things. Uh, another significant event that occurred at about that time was Wei Shi, who eventually became department chair of aerospace engineering and who defected back to China this past summer, mm -hmm. came in 1979 and he bummed around American industry and, and institutions trying to learn as much as he could about aeronautical engineering, space technology, etc. Then in the mid-80s, Sam Wu, who came from China, uh, became head of industrial engineering. And uh, industrial engineering is basically the technology and know-how gold mine. It's like Fort Knox. You know, instead of stealing gold, we steal the information mm -hmm. to, to become a successful nation. And at that time, we started to have a lot of people come in to the arsenal of democracy, the Midwest, where we knew how to make things and design things, and he started basically training uh, the, Ch the Chinese. Um, 1995, another significant event occurred. John Engler was governor, and he met with a person who eventually became uh, the <coughs> vice premier of China. And um, she was brought here by General Motors, and you, John Engler became president of the National Association of Manufacturers, now where he is, which is basically uh, a very, very pro-Chinese organization which is engaged in exporting a lot of our expertise to China at our loss. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 1997, 1999, the University of Michigan started to sign comprehensive agreements with the Chinese government for the education of their students. Uh, in 2005 and 2010, Mary Sue Cohen was now president at the University of Michigan, and she went over there and she signed extensive documents to open campuses over there, to have big exchanges. Right now, for example, there's approximately 2,500 Chinese scholars on the U of M campus. And Mary Sue proudly notes that we are the biggest in the United States as far as educating the Chinese. In, in America right now, there's approximately over 100,000 of these Chinese scholars 
and I use scholars in quotation marks because we find out that some of them are People's Liberation Army, PLA, People's Liberation Air Force, People's Liberation Navy, and of course they don't put this down on their applications when they come. Uh, so we find out that they're really here with the purpose of, of stealing uh, military technology that they can use back home. Now, um, one, of the, one of the things that I've talked to you about before is that um, you know, I'm a student, uh, when I was a student, um, I was in an overseas studies program at, at USC. And so, uh, and I went to Japan. And you know, it's, it's I, what I wanna be able to clarify right up front here is that we aren't talking about the Chinese people as people. There's certainly nothing about cross communication between cultures and and you know studying at an overseas uh, 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 university or something like that. So you know it would seem like it would be okay to have Chinese students come here and 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 to study certain things. But what we're talking about is dual use technology here, aren't we? Yes, um, we're talking about the people who who began their career with Chairman Mao and the Long March. And, and we still have a communist government that prosecutes its own people who are ethnically not Han Chinese, the Uyghurs and other people, and <clears throat> prosecute Christians, etc. So there are lots of Chinese people who are just trying to earn a living uh, and who are having problems with the government too. And yes, during the Cold War when we were dealing with the Soviets, we still had cultural contacts. Uh, we had people here studying the English language, English literature, and vice versa. And that's fine, or humanitarian type subjects. Mm -hmm. But when they're coming over here specifically to steal our lunch, our industrial and military technology, we cannot allow that, and we did not allow it during the Cold War. And, and this Wei Shi, who, who was, became department chair in aerospace engineering in 2005 and did some nefarious things, mm -hmm. you know, he went back in August of this year with his 30 years experience and know-how to help the Chinese continue this program. So we, we have had at the University of Michigan this long tie okay, mm -hmm. with the Chinese, but in the, in, of recent it's been subverted to hurt our nation. Got it. Got it. Um, and uh, I, I know that this is kind of a hot topic right now because just recently we had the uh, unveiling of the F-22 or something, the uh, Raptor? I know it, it goes by the Raptor. Um, our, our machine is the Raptor and, and the Chinese unveiled something that was similar to that. I, I noticed that you brought a model that... Yes, the Chinese unveiled the J-20, which is very similar to, the, to our F-22, mm -hmm. except that it has a canard in front. Uh, that's, that's an obvious difference. And it's, it's perhaps 30% larger, which means more payload and range. And we came out first with the F-117, which is a low radar cross-section uh, aircraft, and then we came up with the F-22. Incidentally, these things cost $350 million each, so it's real money. And <clears throat> like other things we will go into later, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese basically stole the technology to do this. And when the, when the Chinese are stealing, they don't attract much attention because it, it, it's like a million ants with a million grains of sand. 